Hi there. Very good evening once again. Thank you very much for joining me on advanced search methods. Tonight I will discuss about this, uh, the, the structure or the content of a research proposal that you got to write uh, to get the approval of your supervisor to complete your bachelor's, master's or even PhD uh, researches. Now, the reason why you write a proposal is this. Uh, in If you do this bachelor's, master's and PhD, you would be uh, getting other subjects also with this. You might be having some other subjects with this. You have a research subject, uh, definitely. With that, you have some other marketing, HR, uh, leadership, uh, there may be subjects. Now, what happens is, if you study those subjects, HR, marketing, and those subjects, your lecturer will give you the question. So you never make the question. The lecturer would give you the question or the university would give you the question. You just answer that question. When the university give you the question, that question is fit for the purpose. Meaning if you are studying human resource management, you can learn human resource in, in your O levels, A levels, HND degree in many level you can learn. It depends on the level you learn based on the level, the weight of the subject you learn also differ. So, you never get an assignment for your whole level uh, HR management subject at a level of a degree because the lecturer knows how heavy it is. He knows he will make the right he will make the right uh, question that is fit for the purpose so that you would be answering. So when they make a question, in fact, what happens in a university? And since I'm a university for more than ten years, master lecturing for masters. When I teach one subject, I teach leadership, I teach research methods, I teach uh, uh, marketing, I teach HR. So when I'm teaching those, I make the assignment or the uh, exams question for my students. When I make those, uh, after I make that, what, what I do, after I made it, what I do, I give that assignment to another lecturer for an EV, external verification. He verifies that assignment if that question is okay. If that question is fit for the purpose is it at the right level is it too much or is it too narrow is it right things like that and on approval of the second judgment of the assignment only we release that to the student to continue the work that is how it works at least the the module lecturer may make it and at least another uh, panel another lecturer of the panel should check it okay so give me a second Right, so based on the approval of the second judgment only, it is released. Now, in the case of your research, these lecturers, they never make the question. You make the question, you select your topic, okay? So since you select it, it has to be approved by the lecturer or the supervisor in charge of your final research. So to, to get his consent, he has to check, is it within the scope? Whether is it uh, the right fit? Whether is it uh, enough or too big, otherwise too narrow, things like that, he has to check it. To do this, to, 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 to comply with this, you have to write a proposal. Now, when I ask you what question you're going to answer, you may say two lines answer, uh, sorry, what question you're going to answer, you may say a two lines question to me, it is not enough. I want to know many things. I want to know many things so that I want you to write this uh, literature part of it, the problem part of it, the, the, the methodology part of it, all of these things, how are you going to handle this? I have to know. That is why you write it. It is like this. When you want to get uh, uh, your partner, and if you really go through your parents, you always make a proposal that I have a son. This guy wants to marry your daughter, and there's the proposal, shall we have a uh, knot? Shall we tie this knot? That is a proposal. And when these both parties will check into this proposal, is the guy is okay, is the girl is okay, is it right fit, and so on. They don't go for all these things. 
when the proposal is approved by both parties, you say, yes, just go ahead. Otherwise, one party will reject or both parties will say, no, that's not going to be the right fit. We leave it, things like that. So you have to make a proposal, okay? Right, now, how to write the proposal is the first thing I'm going to touch. Now, the next message, uh, let me tell you while I remember, uh, when you submit your proposal, it will contain certain amount of words in it. It will contain certain amount of message in it. Now, let's say your MBA research, they would say you have to write a proposal worth of 20 or 200, uh, sorry, 2,000 or 3,000 uh, word count. You have to write this. And they would say you had to write your thesis, your final dissertation. Uh, it should be about 15,000. Now, don't forget, if you write your proposal, that proposal is going to be part of your dissertation as well. You don't need to replace all of these, what you have written in the proposal when you write your dissertation. In other words, if you have written 3,000 word proposal for your research, you have to only write 12,000 extra word to count to your 15,000. You write it on top of this. Okay, so that is the, 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 the mechanism of it. Let's say you have a proposal here. This is your proposal, 2,000 words. Okay, now if 2,000 words, sorry. Now your, your dissertation should be 15,000 words maybe. And what you do, you take a copy of this, okay? And it is already with 2,000 words and you add another 13,000 words to it and you will get the final document worth 15,000. Right. So what you see in your proposal will inevitably show in the dissertation as well. But there may be some improvements because you write your preliminary literature, you write, you read something uh, initially about the problem and you write in your proposal. And when you do your dissertation, you would do some in-depth reading with some powerful materials and you would get more powerful knowledge on the proposal, on the, on the project, on the problem. So what you do, you yourself find your proposal's quality down so that you take those out of it and you can fill it in with some quality message. That is fine. You should, right? But if your proposal appears in your dissertation, that is not an offense, okay? Because that is your document as well. You're going to build it because what happens is you propose a girl to marry and you marry the same girl, right? You don't marry the girl's sister. Okay, so you would have the girl part of it. So you can contain your proposals, word or message uh, as part of your dissertation. There's a confusion on this. Can I use that? So this is why I wanted to say, well, I remember. And the difference between the methodology of your proposal and the methodology that you could keep in your dissertation is this. In your proposal, you would be using uh, mostly future tense. Uh, you would say this research will be using positivism uh, philosophy. This would be approaching this way. And this research will be using this population, that sample and so on. That is how you write proposal. On the project final dissertation, what you write is this dissertation has used in the past or utilized this positivism and used this sample and so on. So that will be on the past tense. So what you do in fundamental, if you are a tricky person, you take the exact research methodology of your proposal and you put that in the past tense in your dissertation and it is in your dissertation, okay? But make sure uh, you never do on the dissertation exactly what you proposed in your proposal. That happens, right? And let's say you would say, I'm going to test 100 people automatically. It doesn't have exactly happen with 100 people. It happens automatically, maybe for 105 people sometimes, maybe for 95 people sometimes. So it is the, the deviation of it. But you cannot do like this. You, you propose to study 100 people and you have only got 20 people. And this research is not valid because you have to study around 100 people. So in that case, what you say, uh, this research initially meant to study 100 people and unfortunately to uh, limit this number of people to 80 because uh, due to the short supply or due to the, the, the excess, the, the, 
the, the problem of this access to these uh, people because of that, it has limited this. So things like that. So there may be differences, okay? So you have to make mention of those as well, right? So having said that, let me see what you could contain in your research proposal uh, right here. Uh, in your research proposal, you would have a cover page. Okay, now this is actually in fact provided by the university or wherever you study, they would give you a cover page. In that, uh, you would have your name, your supervisor's name, and certain things that university's name stuff. The next page would be your title page where you would be giving a title to your research. Uh, that would be, for example, uh, factors influencing employee turnover in. Uh, XYZ uh, Limited Company in Colombo District, something like supervisor would be the, uh, the, the man would be the right fit for that to, to, to word exactly uh, the title with he would be helping you. Uh, if you need any support, please let me know. You have my number. Right, that is the title page. And uh, after that, you would have the third page. It would be the, the table of content. You would have a table of content. You should definitely have the, the table of content. So that is the third part of your work. Now, the next thing is about in your proposal, remember there are three areas. I'm not calling it three chapters. I'm calling it three areas because in your dissertation, your supervisor would say your research has to have five chapters or maybe six chapters, it depends on the university, but every single research, any university, if you see the research of them, I don't see many differences because I have experience with four universities teaching for them, and I have uh, experience five universities. I did my researches to them, four masters, one degree, one PhD from five universities, different five universities. So and different areas as well, law, business, psychology, and education. When I see all of this, I don't see much differences between the structure of it. But when they segregate that, when they, when they uh, divide them into, into categories, into areas to organize it, or, or seven chapters even, there are things like that. You don't need to confuse. If you bring in the research to me to mark five chapters, I'll pass it seven chapters, I'll pass it even six chapters, I'll pass it as long as I have the message in it. Okay, so it's not a problem. But you have to stick into a university's uh, rack hammer. It is easy because if you keep your boss happy, you get the promotion finished. You don't need to argue with it. You don't need to say, I'm right, why don't you pass me? That's a silly argument. So you just listen to what they say. That's all. Right now, so in your research, we don't use these chapter-wise things, but I would say you don't write that chapter one, chapter two, chapter three. Some universities, they write as well. So if you follow that chapter-wise segregation, you have only got three chapters in here. Number one is uh, the, the introduction part. In fact, we don't name them chapters, chapter one, chapter two. In research, yes, not in the proposal. Here, we say chapter, uh, the, the, the block one or the, 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 the area one where we would be talking about the introduction of your research, the research background, the research problem, the research objectives, the research questions, and the research, the significance of research. So I have covered all of this, in fact, introduction part of it, the research problem, the research objectives, the research question I have covered. And the significance of research is simply this, every single organization have multiple problems. And you and I have multiple problems. Now I'm solving a problem to teach you proposal. After I shut you off from the class, I have a meeting with another one. And after that, I have another problem to solve online, right? So I'm going to be awake. So I have multiple problems. You have multiple problems. You have so many problems. I have so many problems. Well, the significance is this. Which problem you prioritize over the other? How significant this research is? How important? How severe this problem is to be solved? That is what the significance is about. And you have to write this. How significant it is for you? How important it is for you? Because if the research problem is not significant enough, you would not continue doing that research. Okay, if you do something, if that thing is so significant to you, we can expect the result. But if you do that for a fun, then we may think that you will take an early exit from it. That is why the, the, the lecturer, the supervisor, wants to see how significant this problem is to you and to the organization involved in. So 
that is the significance of research you have to write. And after this, the second part is about the literature. You see, I'm talking ex the introduction part here, okay? That is number one, and I numbered them one, two, three, four, sorry, 1.1, 1.2, 1.3, like that. I have numbered them like that, okay? And I never used two here because I have the chapter two to follow. Literature is always in the second part. Don't put them in the first part, okay? And the introduction part, don't put them in the second part, put them in the first part, okay? So literature review is second here. Now, we all know we will have two, three IVs and one DV. So the literature review is this, and I didn't number introduction here. And I gave, 2.0 here for literature review. The reason is I wanted to give 2.1 for the first IV, 2.2 for the second IV, 2.3 for the third IV. If you have fourth IV, 2.4, 2.5, it is up to you. And after that, you would be talking about the conceptual framework. In fact, I missed a point here. The last one, you would, if you have two, two IVs, 2.1, 2.3 IVs, 2.3, 2.4, 2.5. And after that, the DV. So you always discuss your IVs first and the DVs after that. There's a practice. There is no such, but you do it like this. That is the, the way. So if you do, if you follow this, what happens is every lecturer when they mark your assignment, they know this is the order, this is the standard order. So they wouldn't miss reading your document. If you misplace it, if you put the DV up, DV up here and the IVs down here, and after he read this, he would find the dependent variable missing sometimes because they're never going to read your document uh, word by word. You take about six months to complete 15,000 words and I take 10 minutes to mark your assignment. Not more than that, okay? This is my experience. I mark your research in 10 minutes. I give you the marks. And you take that dissertation to a number one lecturer in the world, ask him, is it a fair marking or otherwise ask him to mark it? He wouldn't go 10 marks beyond me or 10 marks less. He may be five marks that way or this way. And he wouldn't take more than 10 minutes on that either. That is the expertise they have. Now, it is, uh, it is obvious that you go to a doctor and you show the reports of your body and you spend days and uh, weeks to get the report. You wait in the queue and get the reports and so on. You give that to the doctor, the doctor doesn't spend more than one second, he just turn pages after pages and, and he knows what it is inside because that is expertise, okay? That is how it happens. When they apply the expertise to market, if you don't have the things in order, you will be the loser, okay? So that is why make sure we use this in the right structure. So literature is always 2.0, not 2.1. 2.1 has to go to independent variable and uh, first variable, second variable, third, fourth, fifth. And the next one would be the DV if you have, uh, if you have finished your independent variable. After that, the conceptual framework and the hypothesis. We learned all of these many times repeated. And if you missed it, please go to the YouTube. And after that, the third part is about your research method. Already. So make sure your literature is not mingled with the literature here. And the, sorry, the literature review is not mingled with the methodology and the methodology is not mingled with the literature above or the, the next part, the appendices part below, right? So make sure it's uh, done properly. Now, research methodology, the first thing I'm talking about the philosophy. The second thing I'm talking about the approach. Third is about the strategy. Fourth is about the choice and the time horizon. And I have thought all these things in the same order. You can go through the, the, the slides and the recordings, you can see. And after that, you have to talk about the data source, data collection, sampling, instrument. These are all in the right place, in the, in the same order I have done. And after that, the analysis part. In the analysis part, I didn't tell you what how to do the analysis yet because we have only done up to the proposal. Analysis takes place when you complete your uh, data collection. Now, at the moment, you have to say a couple of points in here, what software you're going to use to analyze your data and what are the tests you're going to do? It is part of it that I missed to teach you. Let me tell you verbally, 
you would be using SPSS or you would be using Excel from Microsoft or you would be using Minitab. These are all three famous softwares the universities recommend and 90% of the, of the universities and all the universities I worked for, all the universities I studied from, they recommend, uh, I used in fact SPSS and I can teach you that SPSS. I'm, I wouldn't say I'm a master, but I can manage uh, any test you wanted to do. And I'm not competent in Minitab or or Excel, and you don't need to be either. SPSS is easy, straightforward, and it is good. But if you are good in Minitab or Excel, you are allowed to do, but get the approval from your supervisor. If your supervisor is not competent on that, then he would deny that to you. He would recommend you. He would force you to do SPSS. But SPSS, it's already available on YouTube in any, in any way you wanted to. And if I can, let me help you that on later as well. So in this data analysis, what you say is this, I'm going to use SPSS. <laughs> in fact, don't say I'm going to use, you never use that first person language in any of your academic writing. You would say this research is going to use uh, SPSS uh, 2.1 or 21.1. There are versions, you can use any of those. There are no big differences. And you could say uh, this would be using uh, chi-square test correlation analysis, uh, 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 ANOVA test, uh, uh, descriptive analysis. There are analysis. You don't need to understand what it is for now. But let me discuss that when I have time to discuss that later. These are the analysis you would do because you have some statistics and you would want to analyze those by using the SPSS. Uh, remember, I was teaching about uh, two methods of research, two researches. One is qualitative research and the other one is the quantitative research. When you do qualitative research, you don't use this SPSS because SPSS is uh, solely for quantitative analysis. It only can analyze numbers, statistics. And if you want to do qualitative, you can do it manually. You can do it manually. And uh, otherwise, there are softwares for that as well to analyze. And most of the times we do manually because quality uh, is difficult for you to analyze in the softwares. There are softwares, by the way, right? Uh, so we can do that as well if you want. Right, so that is how that is what you only simply say this research is intended to use uh, SPSS 2.0, and the tests intended to do is uh, chi square test to test the hypothesis and correlations between the factors and some uh, uh, descriptive analysis to understand the, the trend of it. And that is enough. Three tests would be enough to do for your master's, and PhD is almost those three tests are enough. And there are hundreds of tests you can do on the SPSS. There are possibilities and it depends on the university's recommend, right? And after that, the operationalization, it is already done, but I've never used that word. So what operationalization is this? In your research uh, proposal, you have to say, you have research question and you have a research question here. It's two different things. I have explained those uh, in the previous teachings. Now the operationalization is about what are the questionnaires you're going to use to measure the research question. You have to map it. If you have three uh, dependent variables, you have three research questions and each research question may have uh, three or four each uh, questionnaires. And you have to map it. This questionnaire is measuring this variable or this question. You have to give a map of that one. That is what operationalization is about. And I will be able to show you one sample of it. So it's easy for you to copy it for your uh, research. So that is your, your methodology part. And remaining part is this, uh, the reliability, validity, objectivity, generalizability. This is what we learned on the previous session. And after that, your ethical consideration. When you do research, yes, there are certain ethics you got to follow. Uh, there are so many. Let me discuss one or two here. Uh, one would be manipulation of your research is very, very unethical. We want to get a result. Now, simply, let me tell you an example. Uh, if you read the, the story of this medical field, I take this medical field all the time to exemplify because there are so many unfair things happening according to my uh, readings on it. Uh, what happens is earlier time, they said, if you have 160 plus blood sugar, you are diabetic. If it is below 160, you are safe. That was the earlier diabetic context. And after that came down to 140, after that came down to 120, now it is 115. I don't know, tomorrow it may be 10. Okay. So my point is, uh, why it was 160 blood sugar 10 years ago, if you have over 160, then you are diabetic and below that you're not. 
And why is it now 115, above 150 is diabetic and below 150 is not diabetic? Message is this. Now, if I want, if I'm a doctor, if I'm a researcher, if I'm a medical researcher, if I want in the class, I can make all of you diabetic today, right? Because there are so many youngsters, your blood sugar is not beyond 115, okay? Now, if I conclude today, if you have your blood sugar above 80, you are diabetic and all of you are diabetic. And I will be selling more metformin insulin tomorrow. Okay, this is what I'm calling unethical. Okay, so it's just an example. It's not to blame any pharmaceutical companies or anything. It's an example to understand. So I can conclude the research the way I want. If I want to make you cancerous, I can make you cancerous today. Okay, so that is possible for a researcher. So we shouldn't do these kind of things. That is one. The other one would be, you may be collecting personal data of people that is so sensitive, that is so confidential, and then you should not reveal that it is not right. Data protection. In some researchers, it is so sensitive and it is uh, connected to some uh, legal context as well. If you want to do research in the UK, that's very, very tough because there's a law, Data Protection Act 1998, and that is uh, that is amended in 2001, of, there's, there's, I think 2008, I think, a new revision of it that was uh, uh, improved, that was, there was an amendment in the parliament on that. And if you go beyond it, if you breach it, uh, you're subject to legal action. So it is uh, legally uh, risky as well. So these kind of things we should not involve in ethically. You may be collecting data from vulnerable people, you know, vulnerable means elderly people, uh, sick people, maybe youngsters, kids, and so on for certain uh, uh, researches. Now, this all uh, very sensitive, we shouldn't reveal the names. You may be doing a research on uh, uh, social or communal disease like AIDS and so on. So if you speak to an AIDS patient, he would be revealing certain things to you. And if you say this guy, X, Y, Z guy said, there is a story, then you're, you're uh, dismantling his trust of the life. So we can't do that way. So there are so many stops. These are all some examples. You may have to consider this. So in your research proposal, you have to tell your supervisor that these are the areas I may be uh, contradictory. I may be encountering with some uh, ethical issues. So I will be taking this kind of measures so that I will be within the ethical limits. You have to establish that. Otherwise, the research proposal may be rejected. UK University is very, very tough in that case. Uh, uh, some universities, some of the different countries, maybe they are relaxed, they are relaxed on it because there is no such laws there. So careful. Uh, by the way, you know, it is not about the law, it's about you. You should be ethical personality. So we should be very careful. And the lead delimitation is about, uh, you have certain limitations on the research you do. Uh, so your supervisor would say there are uh, problems in here. There are issues in here. There are difficulties in here to complete this research in this nature. So I'm not agreeing with you. Otherwise you can't do this then you argue with him. Otherwise, I would say you would justify with him that I would be finishing it. An example would be, let's say, <clears throat> you want to do a research on something uh, in the UK. Now, you are here in Asia. So how are you going to do this research? Then the supervisor would say, you don't have access to those people that are living in the UK and you are here. Then you would justify him that I had the contact details of them. They are all my in my... Uh, LinkedIn profile, they're all my friends, we are all active among uh, us, and I have the contact numbers and I'll be speaking to them and I'll find out. So if you say that you are delimiting it, then the supervisor would say, okay, go ahead. Supervisor would say, you need this amount of money on this and how are you going to do this research? And you would say, I'm going to fund it this way. You would say, okay, things like that. So you, there are limitations, there are, there are uh, uh, distractions or resistance on your way to do the research where your, your supervision supervisor would resist you, would say, I'm not happy with this. And you have to justify, no, sir, it's not like that. It's like this. Let me do it. And as soon as you justify, he would agree with you. So that is what the limitation is about. You have to write that as well. And finally, so this is the third part of it. And your appendices, you don't number them, uh, where you may have your appendix form if that applies. Some universities, they have an, a, a form uh, an ethics form, you have to fill it in. In your ethical part of your research, you simply write what you're going to do. But universities, they, they want to know certain things because you cannot write every single thing in your ethical area of your research, which the university wants to know. 
So university wants to know certain things, so they may have, they have made a form, they had to fill it in. If you fill that in, it has to be attached as well on the appendices. And the research questionnaire you build, it is on the appendices and the time frame to, to do your research, universities, MBAs, masters, they allow you minimum six months, maximum one year to complete your to complete your things. Minimum uh, six months, uh, maximum uh, one year. Okay, so you have to uh, break your time, block your time to finish your research into one year. You would say, uh, I would do this first uh, research, uh, the literature review within these first two, three weeks. And after that, the methodology, after that, the data collection analysis, and you have to block it out. There are examples on it. You can find those out from the Google. And finally, your references, where you got the message from for your literature review. You only refer the literature review. You don't need to refer the methodology or rest of the things. If you do it, there's nothing wrong with it. That is your reference list. You have to refer them properly. If you don't refer, you know, you end up with plagiarism. plagiarism. Now, the final message on this research proposal structure is this, that, uh, when you develop your proposal, don't develop this proposal continuously on your own. Every single part you complete, meet your supervisor and get the approval and you go to the next level. You go to the next level. It is easy. Otherwise, you, you go with the full proposal, 2,500 words, and you worked on it for three months and you go and ask the supervisor for the approval and he is confused, you are confused, and it is difficult. So you meet about five times maybe online maybe in person physically five times and you complete your proposal the more you meet the better the things universities they want you to meet at least five times for proposal and another five times for your research dissertation final so all together ten times and all these should be documented as a log called uh, proposal uh, research proposal uh, sorry the supervisory log we call it and it has to be filled in and that is part of your appendices as well you have to file that in also okay so this is what it is and again one more message by that remember you know in your mba degrees masters phd whatever you do you have other subjects also with that you have your research now your research is always the final subject you complete now you know when i'm calling it plagiarism the Earliest subjects, earlier subjects means other subjects you've done, other modules, uh, they don't uh, comparatively worry about the plagiarism on that the way they worry on the research. Okay. And they, this is the last hurdle, and this is the only hurdle I would say to clear your plagiarism. They check you here definitely. They use the software as Turnitin, uh, Grammarly. Uh, Viper, there are so many things, paid versions and free versions. Uh, most of the universities, they use Turnitin and they go for this similarity check, okay? And they test this one definitely, uh, not the others. That's my experience. So if you don't bother about that one, that is up to you, but be genuine, be a gentleman, gentlewoman to yourself. This is your MBA. Don't, don't uh, contaminate your work. Right, so you do it per, uh, uh, genuinely. And this is very careful. The last research, the last document you submit to, to confer your MBA, master's, BBA, very careful, no plagiarism in it. Okay. So I hope that I have given you something useful to you guys. And I'm so happy because I've done my job and you have a job to do, to do your MBA, BBA and your PhD. And good luck with your studies, keep in touch. And thank you very much for joining me. Thank you very much for staying with me over the past, past few months. Uh, have a good life. Be safe. Live long. Thank you. Good night.